the oil story. My name is Melissa Mann and I'm the museum site administrator and your moderator for the evening. Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with us, the museum is located in Titusville, Pennsylvania and is one of the 21 historic sites owned by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and administered by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. Drake Well Museum and Park preserves and interprets the site of the Drake Well, chronicling the birth and development of the petroleum industry in Pennsylvania and its growth into a global enterprise. We are very pleased to have you join us this evening. Uh, and I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank our event sponsor, the Pennsylvania Independent Oil and Gas Association, as well as our partners, the Friends of Drake Well Inc, uh, for helping the museum to bring this program to you. Before we jump into the presentation, um, I'm just gonna go over a few logistics. Uh, attendees, your cameras will remain off and your microphones have been muted uh, for the duration of the program. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and hold questions uh, until the end of Jessica's presentation so that she can answer uh, or address answers to the entire crowd. Uh, but feel free to add your questions to the Q&A as they come to you. Uh, please also feel free to use the chat feature uh, to make comments or to converse with fellow attendees. Uh, Amanda Slider, the Associate Director of the Friends of Drakewell will be monitoring the chat this evening. Uh, and she will also be adding resource links for you later in the program. Petroleum history has often been a space dominated by the stories of great men. However, when historians inve investigate and interrogate historical resources, a diversity of perspectives emerges, including the voices of women. Talking Back, Women's Voices in the Oil Story is a three-part series uh, that will explore the work women performed in building the oil industry and in building Pennsylvania's oil region. Our presenter this evening is Jessica Hilburn, Executive Director of Benson Memorial Library in Titusville, Pennsylvania. Jessica is a historian and the former head of adult services and reference. A native of Titusville, she holds a Bachelor of Arts in History and Political Science from Mercyhurst University and a Master of Arts from Edinburgh University. Jessica will complete her Master's of Library and Information Science from Valdosta State University in 2021. Jessica's writing has been published by Information Today ABC CLIO Libraries Unlimited, Library Journal, The Oilfield Journal, and her book, Hidden History of Northwestern Pennsylvania, was published by the History Press. Tonight, Jessica will present Women in Labor, Giving Birth in the Oil Days, and her presentation will explore the experience of women giving birth in Titusville, as seen through the lens of Dr. George Barr's obstetrical logs. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Jessica. Welcome, Jessica, and thank you for being here tonight. Thanks very much, Melissa. That's a great introduction. I'm going to pop up my slides here. OK, so as Melissa said, I'm Jessica Hilburn, and my presentation is called Women in Labor Giving Birth in the Oil Days. Uh, Melissa already told you some about me, uh, but March is also Women's History Month, so I'm really excited to do this presentation uh, during such a fun historical month for women. And I just wanted to mention that there, I just, I'm just going to put this up there as a content warning that in my lecture, I'm going to mention subjects that might be sensitive for some listeners. I'm going to talk about infant and child death, maternal death, abortion, and more. And so I understand if anybody isn't comfortable with those things or those are you know, difficult subjects. So if you need to leave at any point, I absolutely don't take offense to that. Please do what's best for you. So to start it all off, how I came across this topic is Dr. George Barr was a practicing physician in Titusville during the height of the oil boom. And in, uh, uh, I'm using the oil boom as sort of like a liberal interpretation as 1859 to the turn of the century. Um, so Dr. Byron, here's a photo of him as well. 
he attended so many home births in the 1900s. And he was born in New York in 1832. And during his early 20s, he was mostly practicing and lying in hospitals. And lying in hospitals, if you're not familiar, were for pregnant women. And it was a very specific type of hospital that you would go to just to give birth. And then you would recover there for a while and you would go home if you were lucky. Um, these type of hospitals had pretty high death rates. And I'll mention them again a little later on, but I'm just giving a little overview for now. So George Barr served in the Civil War as a surgeon and he was married twice. The first time was to a woman named Lavinia. And I mention his wife's names because I think it's ironic that they're so similar to one another, Lavinia and Lovinia. So his first wife and he moved to Titusville in mid 1865. And of course this was after the first commercial oil well was drilled in 1859. So oil was already on the up and up in, in the, uh, the area by the time he got here. Uh, shortly after his arrival, his own son, George, died of hydrocephalus, which is more commonly known as water on the brain. And his son was only three years old at the time that he died. And this happened uh, just within months of him arriving to Titusville. Uh, at the time, his wife was seven months pregnant. And then she gave birth to his next son, whose name was Charles, and he died five months later of the same affliction. So arriving in Titusville wasn't the best of luck for the Barr family. Two years later in 1868, Lavinia died at age 34. And uh, after that, Dr. Barr remarried to Lavinia and her name was Lavinia Hanford. Uh, she had a child from a previous marriage and they also had a daughter together whose name was Eva. Um, he also had an oldest daughter who did survive into adulthood and the two girls ended up being 18 years apart. George Barr was very dedicated to the prosperity of Titusville and in his obituary, the, the people of the region were so indebted to his service that he had a quite an extensive obituary. And they talked about how he would go out in any sort of weather condition in any sort of terrain. And if you think about it at the time in um, the 1860s, 70s and 80s, all the way until his death in uh, 1912, this was really difficult terrain for a doctor to traverse to treat patients. And as intrepid a medical provider as he was, unfortunately, he also practiced medicine at a time where there were many misconceptions about how to treat women who were giving birth and how involved doctors should be. And he was involved in many home births because the, all the births in Titusville at that point were at home. And he started that uh, and sometimes they did not end up so well. And I'm gonna to get into that a little bit. Uh -oh. If I can get it to move, there we go. So it's just some information about some historic maternal mortality rates. Um, the first national reported number on maternal mortality was in eight, 1933. So for the 1800s, we don't really have any statistics about maternal mortality because they just didn't collect any. Um, states began sending their information to the federal government in 1915. So we do have some data between 1915 and 1933, but it's not comprehensive. It just gives you a little bit of a peek into what was going on. Um, no states gathered any aggregate data in the 1800s in the United States. Other countries did, and so we can compare to other countries, but in the United States, they didn't do it. Um, for the first 10 years of reporting, so that would be 1915 through 1925, it's that some of the states are um, contributing their data. There were between 600 and 900 deaths per 100,000 births. And when you're comparing it to 100,000 births, that might not seem like a lot of deaths, but it's almost 1% of mothers dying in childbirth at this time. And as you can see on this graph, it's a very high number, especially uh, compared to what it was later in the 1900s. Specifically, the mortality rate for black mothers was and is much higher than white mothers. It was uh, one time, 1 1.8 times higher for black mothers than white mothers to die in childbirth. And the gap today is unfortunately only getting wider. It's actually not getting smaller. Um, and this 
uh, while I wasn't able to get into this specifically for Titusville with the race part of it, that is something that I plan to look at in the future just because the obstetrical logs are so vast and there's a lot of data in there and none of the data is digitized, it's all a microphone. So it's gonna take me a while to go through by hand and um, figure out all of those numbers. But that is something I plan to look at to see how that specific statistic can be reflected in the Titusville logs. Um, in addition, U.S. mortality rates were much higher than other countries, such as England and Sweden, during the same periods of time. Um, it, they were the highest of any developed country in 1915, and they continue to be pretty high today, which I'll talk about later on as well. Part of the problem with these numbers is data collection issues. So what is considered a pregnancy-related death? Nobody seems to really agree on what that means, but there are a variety of interpretations. Uh, historical data show a much higher mortality rate for physician-assisted birth instead of midwife-assisted birth. And that might not make sense to you at face value. You might think, you know, like if a doctor is there during the birth, there's a higher chance that everything's going to go to plan or that they'll be able to intervene if something goes wrong. And it was actually the opposite. And that's for a very specific reason. And I will let you ruminate about it before I tell you. Um, another thing that's interesting about histor historic maternal mortality is that the rate of maternal mortality was higher if the woman and the family was wealthy. And the rate of infant mortality was higher if the family was poor. So those two are completely inverse. Uh, the main causes of death for women at this time were um, puberal fever, hemorrhage, abortion, and toxemia. And I'll go also go into these. Um, compared to today, um, death certificates in all 50 states in the US now have a checkbox for maternal mortality. And that actually happened very recently, like within the past five years, the last few states added a checkbox for maternal mortality to say whether the death of the person was um, pregnancy related. Um, currently, uh, maternal mortality is only counted if a mother dies within 42 days of giving birth. Um, in 2018, this was 17.4 deaths per 100,000 mothers. So compared to that six to 900, that's nothing, but it's still pretty high, uh, especially for a developed country. Uh, for black women in the US, the rate is 37.1. For white women, it's 14.7. If you're over 40 years old when you give birth, the rate is 81.9. And if you're under 25, it's 10.6. So all of those create a pretty good picture of what it's like to be a mother, both giving birth historically and giving birth today. So some common birth situations accompanied by this lovely photo of uh, giving birth in 1887. So some of those conditions that I've mentioned are ones that are uh, frequently show up in the obstetrical logs of Dr. Barr. Uh, the first one is cephalic, and I did not know what this meant before I start getting into it. And it just means head first, the baby's head first, it's what it's supposed to be. Uh, and next one is placenta previa, which still happens today. The meaning of this is that the placenta covers the cervix and it creates a lot of bleeding and it, um, unable to vaginally deliver the child. Uh, babies can be stillborn or asphyxiate when this happens. Uh, this condition is also a higher risk for very young mothers and for mothers that are over age 35. So if you're not in the sweet spot of childbearing age, this becomes a higher risk. Um, it's also a higher risk for women who have many births in a row, which was very common at this time. Um, I'll talk about a couple women who had many children in quick succession. Um, some of it has to do with um, contraception and the lack thereof. Others are religion. So there's a, a variety of factors that go into play with that. Hemorrhages, of course, which is just profuse bleeding. Um, you see that often in the um, obstetrical logs. Also the use of forceps. And that will factor into a couple deaths later on that I will talk about. Um, a lot of women could also become septic or go into septic shock after giving birth. And there was also, uh, it'll be noted in there whether it was an abortion. So this doesn't always necessarily mean 
that it was a chosen abortion. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, sometimes it is spontaneous, the spontaneous abortion. So that can mean from a fall, like the mother fell and the baby died and she gave birth. Sometimes they will denote that as an abortion or a spontaneous abortion. Um, also in the logs, they will denote uh, specifically if the child was a bastard. And then later on when Pennsylvania started doing birth certificates, they would also write that on the birth certificate. So there's a lot of, I don't know if I wanna call that a gem, but there's a lot of hidden things in these records that are really helpful when people are doing things like genealogy and tracing families. Something that you I see a ton in the logs is SOA. And I scoured all kinds of records for what SOA could mean in a medical sense. I got all kinds of different answers, most of which had nothing to do with childbirth. So I'm interpreting this as safe on arrival for the babies because none of these children died that I've seen it on, none of the mothers died that I've seen it on, and usually there are few, if any, accompanying notes for SOA. And because it is the vast majority of births, that's how I'm interpreting it, but I'm still looking into that one to see if it has a possible other explanation. That one's my history mystery. Uh, and finally, the last one is your pearl fever. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I'm a historian. I read words. I don't say words. So that's how I'm pronouncing it. I hope it's right. Uh, this is also called childbed fever. So this still happens today. It's not eradicated in any sense. Uh, however, it did not happen very often in cases where midwives were the ones delivering babies. And this often happened because of unnecessary interference by doctors. So some doctors wanted to get too involved in the birth process or they were busy, they wanted to move it along, they wanted to go home, they were tired, they had already done a lot of stuff that day, or they just thought they needed to intervene when they really should have just let it go. And this kind of in interference could come in the form of using forceps to pull the infant out, uh, the use of chloroform on mothers, which might sound horrible if you're unfamiliar with the time period, but chloroform was pretty common, even though it was fairly overused, especially with women. And also manual placenta removal. So anyone on here that's given birth or has been around somebody that's given birth knows that after you give birth to a child, you also have to deliver the placenta. And doctors often didn't wanna wait around for that to happen. because Sometimes it took a little while or they just wanted to uh, they thought it wasn't moving at the correct pace, so they would just reach up in there and take it out, which is not what you want to do at, if you can at all avoid it. Um, because of this, it would often cause this purpural fever, um, which is actually a strep bacterial infection in the uterus, and because it kind of goes out of control once it happens, the women often become septic. Uh, numbers for this fever were very high in the 1800s, and this was for one big reason. And if you haven't thought of it yet, now I'm going to tell you, it's because they didn't wash their hands. <laughs> and it's something that we still deal with today, because washing your hands is apparently very difficult for people sometimes. So that was the main cause of this fever. Now today, people wash their hands more, but there's still bacteria. Um, today, you have antibiotics, so if you do end up contracting this bacteria, there's ways that it can uh, fight the infection, whereas back then, you would just get sick and sicker and sicker, and then you'd die. So there wasn't much they could do at that point after they'd already introduced it into the woman's body, and she was already in a pretty, um, a pretty uh, difficult situation where she could, didn't have much control over what was going on. Um, so today, for this fever, it still causes 11% of maternal deaths, which is which a little shocking to me when I looked it up. Uh, one of the issues here is that doctors, if doctors had multiple patients, they wouldn't not just wash their hands before they started, but they wouldn't wash their hands between patients. And they also wouldn't change their clothes because the culture of medical practice at this time was that the stiffer the coat was with blood, the prouder the doctor. So it was more of a mark of honor of how hard you'd worked 
that that was on you instead of, hmm, maybe don't touch me with some other lady's blood. Uh, some doctors saw this and they tried to make a change, but they were extremely rebuffed by the medical profession. And one of the doctors who was one of the driving forces in getting other doctors to wash their hands was even driven completely insane by the criticism of his peers. And he ended up being committed to a mental institution and he died there. Um, as early as 1843, Oliver Wendell Holmes tried to get uh, his fellow doctors to wash their hands, but a certain man, his name was Charles de Lucena Meggs, said no, and he had some very strong opinions about this. So in 1854, he wrote that he, meaning the doctor, is a gentleman who is scrupulously careful of his personal appearance, of great experience as a practitioner, and well informed as to modern opinions on the contagion of childbed fever. Still, those of you who are contagionists, will say that he carried the poison from house to house. And if so, then you ought to give some sort of rationale of the fact that he carry it on his hands, but a gentleman's hands are clean. So his basic argument was that I can't give anybody bacteria because even though I touched a lot of stuff, I am a great man with a lot of knowledge. And so I can't have dirty hands. He went on to say, how could he carry the cause? What was the cause? Was it some ozone that stuck to his hands or coat? Was it a nebula, a halo, or an effluvium, or a miasma that mixed with the hairs of his head, or the woolen or cotton fibers of his dress, or an exhalation from his skin, or a halitus from his lungs? He could not comprehend that it could possibly be things on his hands. It had to be his bad breath or his skin or the clothes he was wearing. So what I said to that was, you should have went with number one, Charles, because it was your, that your hands weren't clean. So getting into what childbirth was like for some specific women in Titusville. And I chose three women from the birth logs because these logs are filled with hundreds of women. More often than not, women that are not given names. So I picked out three that I was able to identify and expand on their lives and also give you a little bit of a look into what it was like for women in different stations in life, different levels of wealth, um, and different backgrounds. So the first one I chose is Emma Gibbs Carter. If you're familiar with Titusville, you might be familiar with Emma Gibbs Carter, or at least her husband, who is John J. Carter. So she is seen often across the log books, and that is because she had nine children. And she only lived to 57 years old, so lots of children. Uh, she was born in 1844. Her family moved to Titusville after her marriage, which was in June, which was June 19th, 1866. She was of Baptist faith. And there are some misconceptions about how many children she had. So when I first started looking into Emma Gibbs Carter, there are some histories that were written that said she had four children which is kind of true. She had four children who survived to adulthood, but she had nine total children. So until you dig into some of these logs, you don't often get a full look at how many children a lot of these women had, because if the children died either in childbirth or young, um, often they're not mentioned in obituaries. So her first child was born on April 19th, 1867, and that was Charles Gibbs Carter. And he was one of the ones that survived to adulthood. Um, she was 23 at the time that she had her first child. Her second child was born February 28th, 1870. This was a girl, her name was Hattie. Um, she died eight months later on Halloween and she's buried alone in New York, which is interesting for this family because the rest of the family is buried locally, whereas this child was buried separately. And um, she's buried where the family was from, but the rest of them didn't end up being buried there. So that sometimes happens in this time period. Uh, February 6th, 1872, she had her next child, but this child was one of those spontaneous abortion ones where she fell while she was pregnant and the child ended up dying and she gave birth and um, they buried the child after that. However, this child is not mentioned in her obituary. Uh, the next one was very soon after. So that was February 6th, 1872. Her next birth was January 16th, 1873. So it was a very quick turnaround. 
And the next child was named Kitty, which is not in the birth logs, but I was able to find through an obituary for this baby uh, because the child died on February 22nd of the same year. So lived just over a month. And something interesting about John J. Carter was that he named things after this child. So he named like his wagon Kitty and things like that. So this was difficult for them. Uh, then in August of 1879, he, they had another child, Emma Carter Zeiss, who survived to adulthood. Then on February 9th, 1876, or sorry, I missed, I, those are backwards, but 1876, Luke, they had Luke and he also survived. Then on September 18th, 1881, she had Alice Carter Herndon Boardman, which is obviously her full name as an adult after her marriage, and she also survived to adulthood. So in the logs so far, I've only been able to find seven births for Emma Gibbs Carter, and I know that there are two more because of census records and because of things that she said. So they might be in there. They might not have been officiated by Dr. Barr. They might, or he might not have presided over those births. He might not have helped with them. Uh, so it's possible they aren't even in the log books because there were other doctors in Titusville at the time. I just don't have access to their records if they have records or if the records survived. So during the final time she gave birth, which was 1881 because that was her last child, uh, she was 37 years old. So she started having children at 23 and her last child was 37. That's a long time to be having children. And she spent in, at least in the ones that I can track, she spent at least 40 hours of her life in active labor, which must have been torture. And that's without the two that I can't find. So um, in Dr. Barr's log books, he would put in there how long the woman had been in labor. Generally, her labor didn't go on too long. It was kind of short, but some of them really dragged on. So uh, they were pretty wealthy people, the Carters. That's a name that um, if you're familiar with Titusville, you uh, recognize when it comes to Carter. So uh, her plight with her children, with having children die either at birth or shortly after birth wasn't due to lack of funds and in this case it wasn't even due to doctor intervention so much as it just was this happened a lot at the time period. Uh, Emma Gibbs Carter died of pleurisy in 1902. Her husband remarried and um, that wife also died young. She was only 58 when she died. So uh, young death is sort of a theme of the time period regardless but it's particularly difficult for women and women who had a lot of children. Ooh, went too far. There we go. So the next woman I want to talk about is Lily McNevin Hahn. So she, I put her in this because she, to me, is a good example of the invisible suffering of women at this time when it comes to difficulty in raising children and childbirth. So she was born in 1862, February 17th, 1862. And she actually is an immigrant. She was born in Toronto, Canada. And she came to the US and her family came right from Toronto to Titusville in 1863. Uh, both of her parents were Irish immigrants. She was married on December 19th, 1881 to Frank Hahn, who was a blacksmith. Uh, his parents were also immigrants. They had come to the United States from Germany and they settled in Buffalo originally. And then they came to Titusville in 1863 when Frank was about six years old. So both uh, people in this case are from immigrant families. And unfortunately, there are some children unaccounted for in their case. So Lily had seven total children, three of whom survived to adulthood. She started having children at age 20 and she was done having children at age 38. So again, 18 years of having children, long time. Uh, the children that survived to adulthood were John, who was born in 1882, Wendell, who was born in 1898, and Irene, who was born in 1900. And uh, some of their children, or one of their children I was able to account for that did die. Her name was Minnie, and she died at age eight of diphtheria. So diphtheria had its hold on the region uh, during the late 1800s and as well as many other contagious diseases 
Um, if you are a reader of the OFL journal, I'll give you a plug because my sister and I wrote an article about contagious disease in Titusville and in the oil region, which I'm sure, which I think was going to be coming out soon. So you can learn more, more about diphtheria in Titusville in that. Um, but in this case, uh, many died of diphtheria and then uh, her sister-in-law, which is the clipping that I have here, this Frederick W. Hahn is her sister-in-law's son. And they also lost children to diphtheria, but they lost three children. So they were also German immigrants and all three of their boys died within two months of each other of diphtheria. So it was something that was very much ravaging the area. So it wasn't particularly surprising to see they had a child die of this. I was actually surprised I didn't see more of it. Um, unfortunately for Lily, I know that she has at least two other children for sure, but they are unaccounted for. They're not mentioned in, in her obituary by name. And I haven't been able to find obituaries for them either. Um, I know that there was a male child born August 18th, 1891, who died at birth. Um, Dr. Barr wrote that the mother, who was Lily, was exhausted from hemorrhages. She had placenta previa during this pregnancy and forceps were applied after the death of the child. So this wasn't a case where it was the fault of forceps that the child died, but they were used afterward. Um, I know that three of her children died in a 10 year span um, and a fourth child died in 1896. And then she had another child in 1898, which was Wendell. Um, so they had a pretty difficult time when it came to raising children. And on the top of the screen there, I have a screenshot from the 1900 census where you can see Lily with her name spelled wrong, but that's pretty common. And about where she came from, Canada, her parents were from Ireland when she came to the US and then her three surviving or her two surviving children, her what her uh, um, her daughter hadn't been born yet because it was 1900. So she was pregnant at the time of this. And then also that Frank's mother was living with them. The last woman I'm going to talk to you about is Margaret Brabson Dunn. She was born July 11th, 1842 in Erie. And both of her parents were Irish immigrants. The whole family was Irish Catholic. And I chose Margaret because she is a great example of an older mother that the during her last the birth of her last child she was 47 years old um, 47 years old would be older to give birth to a child today let alone in the 1800s um, i think that's what they would call like an elder mother something like that there they have sort of a like a backhanded name for older mothers who give birth later in their lives uh, but she had uh, many children. She had seven children, six of whom survived, so she had a better um, better luck with uh, them surviving. Her first was James in 1862, then she had John in 1868, Mary in 1873, Rose in 1878, William in 1879, and Gertrude in 1888. And Gertrude is who you can see here, and this is a copy of, well it's a photograph, of uh, Dr. Barr's birth log. And you can see in this one specifically, it's pretty well filled out, which was nice, not all with all correct information, but a lot of it was correct. And you can see that Margaret is mentioned as well as where she was born, her age, her husband's name, her husband's occupation is a Cooper and his age as well. So he was 50 at the time of the birth of his last child. Um, unfortunately for him, he did not survive much longer because he died uh, just two years later and, or, Yes, and two years later, because it was 1888, so that's 1890. Um, between 1890 and uh, 1900, um, they they had uh, a child die as well. So not all that was the one that did not survive. But because of the census problem with 1890, it's hard to trace that one. So her husband was also an Irish immigrant. He was a Cooper, and he died of stomach cancer in 1890, which left her to care for her youngest four children alone. Um, and the reason I say the youngest four children was because there was 26 years between her oldest child and her youngest child. So a very large age gap. So her oldest child at that time was 28 years old, full grown man. Her youngest child was just two. Uh, Margaret ended up dying on September 19th, 1906. Her youngest child at that point was 18. Uh, she also died of stomach issues and they 
the whole family, they, uh, she and her husband both lived and died in the same house in Titusville on Drake Street from the time they came to Titusville until their dying day. They both died in that same house. Um, something interesting about her is that because I knew that this child was Gertrude, the final, the, the last born child, uh, I wanted to find out what happened to Gertrude and kind of trace her through her life. So I ended up, I was able to find her um, after her marriage, she ended up moving to Bradford and she died on May 2nd, 1958. And she was 68 years old and she had a stroke. And an interesting thing about Gertrude though, is that her death certificate is actually wrong about her birth date because we can see from this log when her birth date is in 1888 and her, and her death certificate said she was born in 1890, the same year that her father died. Um, so it's actually not even possible that she was born in 1890. And it shows the importance of having records like this so that we can corroborate our information. But it's also important to have multiple sources for your information because in this record, it says that Margaret's maiden name was Sheridan, whereas her actual maiden name was Brabson. So sometimes the information can just get confusing or um, misconstrued. So you want to make sure you have multiple sources anytime you're doing research um, with genealogy or history or anything like that. So I thought this was a, a really good example of that. And then up top, you can see them in the 1880 census. So you can see John and Margaret and their children. At that time, Rose was listed as Rosa, how old they were, what they were doing. Um, and that was, of course, the last census that John, her husband, would appear in. So some common issues that I run into with these birth logs, as you can see, there's three, I have three examples here of some different problems. So on the left, this is an example of the father's information. So as you can see, all their names are filled out. A lot of their occupations are filled out, where they were born, how old they are. Um, ignore this part here, if you can see my mouse, because that part is um, comments about the birth. So like up here, you can see it says, it says hemorrhage. Down here, it says hemorrhage, things like that. Um, so the father's information are, is these other columns. And it's fairly comprehensive, which is nice if you want to learn about the fathers, but not very nice if you want to learn about the mothers. Because we have uh, the example in the middle, this is a very um, representative example of what the vast majority of the birth logs look like for women. So right here, if you can see my mouse, is what is where the names would go for women. Most of them are completely blank. Some of them have a last name. And a very obvious part of it is this one because, oh, there's a woman's name in there. Why is that woman's name in there? Well, that happens to be George Barr's wife. So he put her name in there because he knows his wife's name. So often it would only be getting filled out for people that he knows personally, he knows their information, he can write it down. Um, or so it seems like that in some of the logs he was asking them the information, um, but that was not consistent at all. And to the right, I have an example of wealthy families, children's names. So you can see here that Eva Barr, which was George's daughter, is named first name and last name, as well as uh, a child from the Biles family that someone later on went back in and wrote the name of the child, because obviously it's not in the same handwriting. So some of the uh, more prominent families, the more well-to-do families, their records are more filled out. And this is pretty consistent across the logs that you know names that you recognize when it comes to Titusville things, that their children are mentioned in more detail or their mothers are mentioned in more detail um, than just the, the Jane Doe's of the world, which is basically what they are because they don't have any names. So any of the births here that I wanna follow up on, what I have to do and what I did in multiple of these cases, because these are just three of the many that I researched before I picked the ones I wanted to um, present to you. But I would have to go based on the man's name figure out who his wife was and then go into her stuff and figure out you know her story her children see if i could find him or her in any of the other places in the log because the log is divided into two very different parts one is alphabetical one is chronological 
Um, so it depends on the time, depends on the people. So it's pretty complex and sometimes convoluted. So to bring it all around back to the present day, have we gotten any better? Yes and no. Rates are lower than they were before, but women are still dying consistently. And the most important part is they're dying preventively. The United States still has one of the highest maternal death rates of uh, countries of our wealth status. So when compared to nations of similar wealth levels, the United States ranks number 10 out of 10, AKA the worst in maternal mortality. And these counts only include women under 44 years old and deaths that occur within 42 days after birth. Um, the important part about this is that the CDC counts an additional 24% of maternal deaths occurring more than six weeks after birth. And so those deaths are not showing up in these numbers. So really it's undercounted to what the real statistics are on maternal mortality even today. Um, because if we're not including women who were over age 44, we already looked at the 1800s where the one woman was 47. So, um, and if you've heard anything, you know, on the news or anything of late, the, the maternal age of first child or any child is consistently going up in the United States. So if we're not counting older women who are giving birth, we're missing a big part of the picture. The leading causes of death today are cardiovascular issues, hemorrhages, infections, embolisms, mental health, such as suicide, overdose and poisoning, and preeclampsia. And most women dying have a high school education or less, and there are huge racial disparities still to this day. Unfortunately, the CDC has determined that two out of three maternal deaths are deemed preventable. So this can include anything from mental health where there could have been some sort of intervention, infections like um, childbed fever that still occurs, you know, too many people interfering in the birth process or bacteria being introduced, uncontrolled bleeding and hemorrhages and heart problems that could have been addressed beforehand or even right after. Um, just a lot of it is still going um, unaddressed and also unreported. So here are the different things that I looked at uh, when I did this research and I'll just leave it up for a second in case anybody wants to see it. And also here's another delightful picture. This one is from 1830, so it's a, a bit earlier, but this was a woman in bed after giving birth and it was an engraving. And um, that is much nicer conditions <laughs> than most women were giving birth in, in, in that period or even as many as 70 years later, or even today really. Uh, so that is, you know, a snapshot into what it was like to give birth in during the oil days, during the height of the oil days. Um, obviously there are a variety of specific stories that I still plan on getting into more with these blogs because it's um, such a wealth of information. Um, but this was sort of a, a starting point and a springboard for even more research for me. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them and I appreciate you listening and attending. Thank you so much, Jessica. It is just fascinating. And the connections from, from you know, the 19th century to today, um, really, you know, there, it's, such a, it's such a relevant topic uh, today. And to be able to make those, those connections is, is very interesting. Um, just a, a personal aside, when I was in graduate school, um, one of the, I was a graduate teaching assistant for a course that was the history of modern medicine, um, which started in 1850. Uh, you know, that's when the course started. <laughs> and it was the scariest class I've ever taken, you know, that I've ever <laughs> helped in because, you know, to, to think that modern medicine, all the advancement uh, that we have today happened in such a short period of time. Um, and that, you know, just 170 years ago, people didn't understand how germs work. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It is really frightening. We have some questions. Let's see. <clears throat> um, where Jen Burden would like to know where uh, you located these birth logs. That's a lovely question and I should have addressed that to begin with. But these are at Benson Memorial Library. They're on microfilm 
and anybody who wants to look at them is more than welcome to come in and I can show them to you. And uh, Jen has also asked um, any ideas on the incorrect birth year for Gertrude. Um, she says she came across this once, but the reason seemed to be that the mother was unmarried at the date of birth. Oh, that'd be an interesting uh, reason. Obviously it wasn't in this case. Um, my, I mean, I have a few guesses as to why. Um, I know that when records are oral instead of you know, on paper or on anything, it's easy to get confused, especially when you're the last of so many children um, for the mother to get confused and because her husband died so shortly after. So it might've just gotten repeated incorrectly so many times that it's just what stuck. And then it's what she told her children who filled out the death certificate because obviously she wasn't the one to fill out her own death certificate. It could have just been a misunderstanding by somebody saying a year and then the person who attested to the death certificate just wrote it down incorrectly. Um, there's there's so many options. Um, in this case, my gut guess would be that they just told her her birthday incorrectly. And she probably thought for her whole life that she was two years younger than she was, which I mean, good for her. <laughs> um. Uh, Charles has a question in the chat. How many births occurred in one year during the oil boom years? That is a great question. And one that I would like to answer in the future. I can't answer it right now because I just haven't counted. Um, and the reason for that is that it's kind of complex. So I would be able to tell you how many births that Dr. Barr officiated at during this time period, but I would not be able to tell you how many happened in total. Um, unless I'm able to come across that in some sort of like year end medical record. And even at that, if it was published in the newspaper, which sometimes they did, um, but even at that, it would only include ones that were reported um, since there was, there were no birth certificates at this time. So there was no reason to tell anybody that you had a child. There was no reason to ask for a doctor unless you really wanted one. Um, a lot of people had midwives and those records would have been kept personally, if at all. Um, so it's difficult to say how many children were being born, but I might be able, able to like sort of extrapolate a number from Dr. Barr's records, given that he was the primary physician that attended most births. So hopefully I'll be able to answer that question sort of eventually. <laughs> uh, Kelly has a question um, and she says, great discussion. Um, and do you have any insight on how Titusville OBs like Dr. Barr viewed local midwives? Oh, I love that question. I don't know how he viewed them because I've never seen any personal writings by him other than these birth logs. They didn't, it didn't mention them in his obituary or anything like that. I would love to, that would be a great angle for looking to see if he ever wrote anything in the paper about midwifery midwifery or um any views he had of the medical profession i he he was fairly well known as a doctor um i don't want to put words in his mouth obviously but the general feeling about midwives at the time he was practicing medicine was not positive um, they didn't really look well upon them they didn't really think that they had much knowledge even though they had vastly more knowledge in certain things like washing your hands than doctors did. Um, so I would love to know if he was more supportive of them than the general medical profession. We have a number of questions about midwives. <laughs> um, uh, Leanne asks if you have run across any records of doulas or midwives working at the time. I have not, but if anybody does hit me up because I'd love to see them. <laughs> Very good. Um, Sue Bates asked the same question. Um, and then you know, is there a way for us to figure out how many midwives were kind of in operation um, in, in um, the Titusville region at that time? The only way I can think of to figure it out would be to just look through any newspaper mentions of anything to do with the midwife, whether it was like, I'm a midwife and I can attend your birth if you need me sort of thing. Or if it was even more of like the negative side, like a child died and they mentioned a midwife, something like that is possible. Um, there, 
I know there were there were undoubtedly midwives working in this region because a lot of people would just wouldn't have been able to afford to have a doctor come to their birth um even if he was being nice you know there were there were so they were having so many children that at some point his niceness wasn't going to pay him to live so there had to be other people attending births um so yeah that would definitely be an angle for looking at the future and expanding this discussion about childbirth and and looking to see if there are any mentions of midwifery in the paper archives one one last follow-up on midwives mm -hmm. <laughs> uh sarah goodman um asks if uh, in the birth logs, um, Dr. Barr made any notations about um, attending to issues that were, that came about during a midwife session, right? During the birth. Uh, oh, like where somebody else was also there. Or, or where a midwife was, was convening over the birth, but an issue happened, the doctor was called in. I haven't seen one that doesn't mean it's not there because it's really long like these are hundreds of pages and it's in that lovely cursive writing that they love so much mm -hmm. and with these great quality this heavy sarcasm great quality scans that they have so um it's uh possible that it's in there it's not across any of the ones that i've seen most of the notes that i've seen sometimes i feel like i have seen ones where they he's mentioned another doctor um, but he was pretty close with the other doctors in the region at the time. He was kind of like the recruiting guy. He was like bringing them in and stuff. And um, he pioneered the Titusville Board of Health. So he was mostly in with other doctors. I haven't seen anything about him being at a birth that was going wrong because of someone's uh, like mishandling of it. There's lots of births that I feel like he um, isn't a hundred percent honest about what happened, or he kind of just says like, "Here's what it is, not my fault." Um, so not, you know, it, it's hard to pin blame for something like that when obviously none of us were there, and what were the people going to do about it? I mean, there really was very little recourse that they had for a child that died or a mother that died, but he was. I don't want to say he was callous because they're just logs. It's not like they're diaries, but sometimes he'll just make a notation where he'll say like, um, mother died one week later or mother bled to death or something like that. I mean, it's very, you know, here's the facts, here's what they are. I'm not going to go into why this happened. So some of it's hard to extrapolate why he was there, um, but I haven't seen midwives mentioned specifically, but I love the people asking about midwives because I love that, love midwives. <laughs> Uh, Garrett has a question, uh, which is, when did hospital births uh, or lying in births become the norm in Titusville? Oh, in Titusville? That I don't. Well, Titusville didn't have a lying in hospital. So um, like a specific lying in hospital, you would have to go somewhere else for that. Those are typically like a bigger city metropolis sort of thing, which at this point, Titusville wasn't a metropolis um, in the ones I'm looking at. Uh, I'm talking like Buffalo, places like that, where they would be bigger, uh, lying in hospitals. Philadelphia, um, that'd be another one. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. That's just a straight up answer. I don't know. <laughs> uh, we have another question. Any idea when specific obstet obstetric doctors showed up in the area as opposed to general practitioners? Mm, that's a that's a good question too and it, it i mean it's kind of like a multi-pronged question because how a doctor would describe their practice and how we would do it today i think would be quite different so dr meyer might have felt like he did specialize in obstetrics at the time you know because he did it so much um, he might have felt like he specialized in infectious disease because he started the board of health it's kind of hard to tell without seeing some more personal writings by them, how they would have described their own profession and what they were specializing in. I would say my, my historical interpretation would be that he would say he was an obstetrical doctor. And I only say that because when he did his earliest type, what we would call today like residency interning type things, he did it at a lying in hospital. So he didn't do it at 
you know, it, as a GP, he didn't do it as anything like that. He was, he was looking at childbirth when he was 22 years old. He immediately was drawn to that. So I think if you, you know, that seance and brought back George Barr and you said, what did you like to do as a doctor? And he would say, I help birth babies. I think that's what he would say. Um, when it comes to doctors that might have identified themselves specifically as that or more outwardly, that I'm not sure. Uh, Sue Bates uh, sent us a comment uh, that the women's wing of Titusville Hospital opens in 1901 with two beds. Oh, two beds. Uh, which I am assuming <laughs> that she that she came across that information in prep in preparation for her talk next week. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Um, let's see. Sue had another question. Did Dr. Barr ever learn to wash his hands? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope everyone learned to wash their hands. Um, what I would like to do, and that's kind of like a segue from that question, is um, compare the death rates of women early on in his practice versus more when he was winding down to see if there is a difference between how many women were dying in, you know, anywhere from the 60s to the 80s versus when he was come in the final years of his practice in the late in the mid to late 90s and the very turn of the century. Um, Amelia Carr has a question. Are these birth logs commonly found in archives or is this an unusual find? I'm, you might be able to help me with that actually. I have no idea. I've never seen a birth log anywhere else other than here, but I maybe they exist in other you know small places. Do you know, Melissa? Um, I haven't come across them in my research, but my research isn't in this area, so. <laughs> yeah, I feel like probably so. there'd be, you know, they'd be around because these small town doctors that were doing a lot of this stuff, they tended to keep good records. It's just whether they've been preserved or not, whether, especially when it comes to women's health, whether the people who had them at the time deemed them worthy of preservation, which is such a difficult thing when it comes to any kind of women's history is that, you know, women were doing lots of things. They were giving birth and they were participating in suffrage like Emma Gibbs Carter was and stuff. It's just, what did people see, men, determine what was right to preserve and protect for future generations to then be able to go through with a fine tooth comb? That's really the problem. They were doing it all along. It's just hard, harder to trace. So I think they're out there. I just don't know if they're publicly available. They might be in some descendants back closet or something like that and they just don't know what they are or they got destroyed. Uh, Hillary would like to know if you came across uh, or if you have come across any references to contraceptives. I have not come across any references to contraceptives um, though I would love to especially for some of these women who when I'm looking at the logs and it says 13th birth I would love to come across some, some note about contraceptives, but it really, particularly because of religious overtones for a lot of these women, if when you look into them and you see their backgrounds, um, having a lot of children was never looked at as a bad thing. Um, not that it is a bad thing inherently, but it was never looked at as a bad thing because it was just what you were supposed to do. Um, so no, I've never come across that, but I definitely will keep an eye out for it. Uh, Jen Burden has a follow-up to our, your, the previous question about the logs. Um, do you know why or how Dr. Barr's log was preserved? What the provenance is there? I don't know if it says on it. I don't think it does. It was one of the ones that was sent to um, LDS. The, the Church of Latter-day Saints is who owns a lot of the genealogical records in the United States really as a whole. Um, so I know that they were sent to LDS and then they were put on microfilm. I don't even know where the originals are. They might have the originals out there in Salt Lake City. Um, but I know that's how Benson got them because it says in the beginning of the role. Uh, Megan uh, in the chat has said that there's an ad in the August 4th, 1866 Titusville Herald for a professional midwife services, um, and that she would love to read a book about midwives in the area, hint, hint. 
<laughs> nice. <laughs> it would it would be very interesting. Maybe it's just interesting to me. I'm glad that there are people on this, so it's not just interesting to me. Uh, but I yeah, think, I think people would I'm, buy this book. There were a lot of a lot of midwife questions. <laughs> yeah, this was honestly this was the first thing I looked into. I'd be I've been interested in these logs for as long as I've seen that they exist. So this was the first chance I got to really dive into them. So all of these are great springboard questions for me for more uh, writing and research. Uh, we have another question. Juliet would like to know if Dr. Barr was ever held um, responsible for a child's death. Oh, not that I've ever seen. Uh, Dr. Barr was um, lionized for his work. He was never maligned in anything that I've ever seen. Um, and that could be, you know, virtue of his reputation, virtue of the time period, but also, you know, if something had gone wrong, you know, how honest are the people being about what's going wrong? Because if you don't know anything about childbirth or you don't know anything about medicine, it's really easy to be convinced that whatever went wrong isn't the fault of the person who's doing something. And that it stays true today, that if you go to the hospital and there's something wrong with you and you get sicker or you die, something terrible happens, it's so hard to prove that it was somebody's fault. And you, although you might feel that in your gut, even now, it's hard to, you know, put that blame on a doctor because they make it feel like they know so much more than you. And that at this period of time was going to be even more heightened, particularly because he was a civil war veteran. They weren't going to be apt to malign him for any sort of mistake. Um, Janet Aaron has a great question, which is how many people are enjoying this presentation this evening? Um, thank you, Janet. I, for one, am. <laughs> uh, and we've got some folks raising their hands in the chat. Thank you. Um, I have a final question, which is kind of a common question that we're gonna have uh, throughout this series. Um, as you know, um, and as, as many folks know, that the museum um, has a goal um, right now of broadening the story, that the, the story that we're telling about oil history by including more and new perspectives. Um, and you know, through this series, we're specifically looking at women's perspectives. Um, but as you mentioned, Jessica, even in this talk, you know, even with all of the, the great records that you, you know, that you're looking through, we're still not getting all women's perspectives. Um, so my question to you is, as you move forward into your research, um, how are you going to broaden the perspective um, in, in this particular, uh, in this particular uh, research area? Yeah, it's really important when it comes to this, specifically when it comes to childbirth, because there are such disparities in age, in wealth, in race, that those things be taken into consideration. And um, though this presentation focused on three white women, it's not like the only people giving birth in this time were white women. There were women of color giving birth in Titusville. There was a large population of color in Titusville. And I think these logs are a great way to shine some light on that population in a way that we haven't been able to otherwise um, in this very shared human experience. Um, I also wanna make sure that people of different ages are represented. Like it's not just, you know, all young women giving birth. It's not just all, you know, in their 20s and 30s giving birth. It's a wide variety, a wide range of people, a wide representation of people. And also people from a variety of walks of life, whether they are wealthy, like the Carters, or they are um, just your sort of average blue collar type workers, immigrants, um, people, a lot of these people who lived here at the time did not speak English. So that'll be a part of my research as well. Imagine giving birth and you're having your doctor there and you can't even communicate because you don't speak the same language. Um, also people who didn't want to be pregnant. You know, you have a pretty vibrant sex trade at the time. So looking into, you know, the abortions that were spontaneous versus the ones that were chosen. What were the lives like for women at the time? Women that are in the logs that don't have husbands, that don't have any sort of male figure named in there and what their futures ended up being and what kind of comments the doctor made about them at the time. So I think there, this is an area that is ripe for representation. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to to seeing where you where you take this subject matter, uh, like I said, it's it's 
so relevant and and exciting new research. Um, so thank you so much. Um, while you give me control back of the of the of the screen here, tell us uh, where we can purchase your book. Oh, that's so kind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my book, uh, Hidden History of Northwestern Pennsylvania, you can purchase it on um, the Arcadia publishing website, or you can purchase it on Amazon. It's on both. So, uh, or, and it's also in some local stores as well. I think like Stonehouse Jack has copies in Titusville. There's some other um, small businesses that have copies. So wherever books are locally sold, it could be there. It's got great got great history in it please if you if you're interested go find a copy um i would like to take this opportunity once again to thank jessica uh for giving us her time she is always so generous uh with uh not only sharing her research with us but uh talking to us about uh directions that we can take uh the museum's research in and exhibitry and interpretation um and she's just a great partner and we so, so enjoy having you, uh, Jessica, so thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, the Pennsylvania Independent Oil and Gas Association for being the uh, sponsor of our series. And uh, if you enjoyed this evening, please join us next week on April 1st uh, for our second installment of Talking Back, Women's Voices in the Oil Story. Um, we will have a presentation by the museum's curator, Sue Bates, um, entitled, Privilege and Politics, Women's Activism in the Oil Region from 1880 to 1921. Uh, Sue is going to be taking a look at uh, the wives of oil uh, producers, wealthy oil producers and oil industrialists of the time and how they were able to leverage their, their privilege and their position through social work in the community. Um, so it's going to be an, an exciting presentation. So please, uh, uh, if you haven't already registered, go onto Facebook, uh, onto our face Facebook page, and please register for next week's event. And we look forward to seeing you all. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. And thank you again, Jessica. Thanks for having me. <laughs>